This programme in the series Unbinding Our Stories brings us two harrowing tales. The first is from Kocharani Abraham, who was a nun for two decades, but had to leave her order in order to better speak freely, and she's now a lay theologian. She describes the terrible bullying of the congregation of Mother of Carmel in Kerala, but she also gives us a personal account of her support for a young mother superior repeatedly sexually violated by her bishop, and of the persecution she and her brave young companion sisters have suffered since for the crime of demanding justice. We'll hear part two of Kocharani's talk on Thursday. Hello everyone. In this presentation, I will be focusing on women religious and human rights in the Indian church. I do this as someone who has been a formal religious for over two decades and who has chosen to live religious commitment in the cloister of the world now. I shall begin narrating two stories relating to sisters of two different communities and their experiences of gross human rights violations. Since I have been directly involved in both these cases, based on my first-hand experience and analysis, I shall explain what I see as the root causes underlying these violations and then see what could be a possible breakthrough in this situation. The first story I call the Nyarakal story, as it happened in a place called Nyarakal in the state of Kerala, South India. This is the story of a major struggle for justice by a small group of nuns belonging to the congregation of the Mother of Kamal or the CMCs, the first indigenous congregation for women in Kerala. The CMC nuns set up the school for girls in 1945 at a place called Nyarakil that comes under Ernakulam Angamali Archdiocese in Kerala. Since the sisters were not well equipped, then with the necessary skills demanded for running the school, they appointed the local parish priest as manager. Though this was a temporary arrangement, it continued as a customary practice. And as managers, the parish priests began to interfere in the affairs of the school, causing much distress to the sisters. After decades of confusion, a turning point came in 2007 when a new team of sisters were appointed in Narakal with a clear mandate from the congregational leadership to sort out the conflict with the parish and to gain clarity over the resources of the convent. During this process of sorting out the issue, the sisters discovered a document forged by the local church authorities that formally changed the management and the educational agency of the school in favor of the vicar of St. Mary's Church, Nyarati. Shaken by this information, they ran to the bishops of the diocese for justice but they were told to reconcile with the local church and to forgive the priests if there were any untoward moves on their part. What started initially as a move towards conflict resolution with the local parish turned out to be a legal battle between the Sisters of Nyarakal and the church authorities. All through the legal process, the sisters were subjected to spiritual and emotional abuse by the church leaders, which was the price they had to pay for asserting their rights over their own resources and mission. But their greatest suffering came from the hostility and alienation that they encountered within their own congregation for taking a stand against the church leaders. A legal settlement was reached in 2015 with the Supreme Court verdict stating emphatically that the school and its properties belong to the CMC congregation. However, after a spell of apparent peace, the province leadership began 
the moves to gift Nyarakil Mission once again to the local church. And the struggle for justice initiated by the sisters continues. The second story I term as the Korvelingat story, as it happened in a place called Korvelingat, again in Kerala. And it continues to fester even to date as a small group of sisters are engaged in a legal battle against a certain bishop. The story refers to the infamous case of an Indian nun filing a criminal case against a bishop of repeated sexual violations over a period of two years. She was initially paralyzed by fear and shame to speak up against the bishop, who was the patron of their congregation. However, when she pulled up courage and reported the crime to the church authorities and her congregational leadership, she was confronted by silence, indifference and blame. Finally, on being cornered further by the bishop, she took recourse to the law of the state for justice. But to her horror, she was accused of tarnishing the image of the church by the members of her own congregation and that of the official church. After a tedious process of trial that the survivor nun and her companions had to undergo in the lower courts, they were shocked by the verdict that acquitted the bishop for want of evidence. However, the nun has contested the verdict by filing an appeal in the High Court of the State, and church authorities have largely remained indifferent on the grounds that they wait for the law of the land to take its course. For the survivor nun and her three young companion sisters who risk their lives to take a stand with her, their right to a dignified existence as consecrated women has been at stake ever since they filed a criminal case against an abusive and much influential church leader. They have been disowned by their own congregational leadership and labeled offenders for having taken a bishop to court. They were accused of disobedience for refusing to accept transfers, which they cannot accept as they need to remain together until the case is settled in the Supreme Court of the country. They continue to be ostracized and persecuted, and their future remains a question mark. Both these stories point to the fact that violations of rights within the ecclesiastical framework are encountered in multiple layers. The outermost layer points to what is blatantly abusive, whereas the deeper layers depict the subtle and covert expressions of violence, which in turn bring more suffering because the actors at this level are those from whom one would expect greater understanding and support. Other expressions of human rights violations experienced by Indian women religious include Many forms of gender violence, such as low wages for work in ecclesiastical institutions, harassment in pastoral engagements, ignoring their professional and personal competence, humiliation due to negative criticism by clergy from the pulpit, and refusal to administer sacraments or celebrate Mass in a convent when the clergy are challenged. This was brought out in a study commissioned by the Conference of Religious India Women's Section in a book titled, It is High Time, Women Religious Speak Up on Gender Justice in the Indian Church, published in 2020. When one is broken, the body suffers. Let's pray for healing for one another. When one is broken, broken the body my suffers. Let's pray for healing for another. Let's pray. Sister Anita has long experience as the director of an institute of social service near Delhi. 
She's now able to give a calm account of the abuse she suffered as a young nun at the hands of priests and seminarians. She'd much rather stay silent, but she offers her public disclosure as a service to the church. I must say that first of all, I've had fairly a very good experience because I relate, I can relate equally and very comfortably with all. Unfortunately, I do have some very unpleasant experiences, uh, which I'm not very happy to say, but I take it as a service to the church, service to humankind. If, I, if my sharing can help. My first uneasy experience was in around 1998 when I was in Pune doing my theology I had gone to one parish outside JDV campus I had gone out because I heard that one priest was from a particular place where which I knew somewhere Mumbai or whatever you can call it I went because I said ah, a known person I mean known means known to my known person okay i just went there to just greet the person the priest there and i said hello father hi hi nice we introduced ourselves he said come come see my school uh, he was a principal he said come come i'll show you my school i said fine okay you know I, i'm born and brought up in bombay and in bombay we just relate very freely i said okay i with full trust i went up and as we were climbing the steps uh, this priest came closer to me and he was like trying to uh, put his hand around my waist like I, I first got a little shock. I said, he is not even my friend. I don't know him also. Then why he is taking the liberty to uh, touch me like na? I said, father, father, and I moved away. Uh, no, 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 I just moved without saying first anything. Then again, I thought the second text again when we were climbing. Then I said, uh, I said, Father, please, I don't like this, I said. No, 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 it's okay, just friendly gesture. I said, I'm so sorry, Father, I don't like this, I said. And I said, Father, let's go down, let's go down. I didn't want you to see school only. I said, Father, let's go down, I'm getting late. And I just ran, I came down. You won't believe. I was shivering. I got temperature. I ran to my room and I just laid down and I was shivering and I was, is this real <laughs> that is happening to me but I kept quiet I didn't share this with anybody the first was very traumatic I must say I was in a tribal place I was sent for my community experience as a novice one evening there were some seminarians who came they have their experience you know village experience um, three days, four days, that they used to come. And that night they were to spend their time in the village. And that day, unfortunately, we were only two sisters. So one sister said, Anita, I'm not feeling well, the senior sister. Can you accompany these brothers to the village? I had to accompany these people. There were uh, two or three of them. I said, OK, I'll, I'll go, no problem. I had no difficulty as such. So I went there. The night in the village, it was a tribal hamlet. We had our regular meeting, Gauki and uh, adult literacy class. And after that, we used to eat in the house, one of the houses, whatever was served. And uh, we would sleep in the um, house of the family. And I know it is not a comfortable at all. I mean, the cattle is there, the hens, the poultry is there and everything is around and you have to sleep there, you know. And I have no problem. That day it was raining and that family was also having a problem. So they asked us if you all can sleep in the um, um, classroom. A classroom was there. I said, okay, in order to help them, I said, okay. I said, Brothers, we have only this place and we cannot, I cannot come down alone from the village. Okay, okay, sister, okay, okay. And I, I only trusted 
the brothers. For me, I have grown up with three brothers, my own brothers, many cousins. I have really no problem, you know. It was all fine, I think, and suddenly, in the middle of the night, I realized someone making inappropriate uh, uh, advances towards me, and I resisted. I first pretended I was still sleeping, and I was resisting. But this fellow was really, really very, very, um, I don't know what to use the word. He was, he had decided that he had, he wanted to make use of the opportunity. He tried to really um, touch my private parts. And I, I, you know, the thing is because that other one father, brother was also there. And I was so feeling frightened, ashamed. I said, my God, if I say something that other, other brother will, what he will think that we both are having some affair or what something. And I'm trying to be quiet, same time resisting. And in between when it was getting difficult, I, I just got up pretending that I wanted to go to the toilet. I went out, of course it was in the nature, and he came behind me there. Oh God, I got so scared. He came behind, and anyway I escaped and I still came back there because I had no other place to go, middle of the night, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, how can I run home to my place, convent? I went back, and again, it was, um, I, it was a very dirty encounter, I would say. He was trying to push himself on me to penetrate and I just pushed him out, almost like a, what you call, uh, fight, na? <laughs> what you, uh, like uh, boxing. Na? I was just pushing, I, I had my strength. I pushed him so much and I could feel he was fully excited quite hard I could feel but somehow I pushed him out and soon I felt all wet in my hands you understand what had happened so when I when it was all wettish and I was feeling so dirty and all and I said and then 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 that was the uh, my relief he stopped making advances after that as soon as little light came at about 435 I just came out and I had fever, I got fever and I just told them I'm not well, I'm going home. I just ran down. It was in a hamlet on the hills, no? you'll know. I just came down running. I was having fever and I straight went. We had a house in our chawl system. We had another room one more room. I just told them I'm having fever. I just went to sleep. I covered myself with a blanket and I was shivering with fever. I did not have courage to say this to anybody because I felt I was wrong. Because people will think I am bad. I am wrong. Before making my five-year vows, I during my retreat, in that place, I saw on the notice board, those priests can notice board I saw, that fellow was going to get ordained. And I told my retreat master there, I said, Father, I'm getting disturbed with this incident. So I told the retreat preacher, I'm feeling disturbed. My only thing is concern is this man should not go and uh, misbehave like this with other others. Say, so then I went, <laughs> I went to the seminary, the rector, I said, under, under what you call uh, confessional secret. I told father, I don't want you to take any action because I know I'm too late to come and tell you. All these years I kept quiet, I didn't tell, but I want to tell you about this one person. He has this weakness, difficulty. If you can help him, because my only intention that in future he should not do the same thing with others. These things. Uh, should not happen and even if it happens how we should uh, counteract how we should behave not get paralyzed you know numbed 
if i was numb that day those days i don't know what would have happened to me luckily i had a presence of mind i could just protect myself and get out of it